So, Rebecca, you decided to take a life sabbatical. You were again how old at this point? I was turning 35. Mm -hmm. Um, This is where my another pivotal life change came. Mm -hmm. Because I had been working really hard and, um, and I wasn't healing. And I, I knew I wasn't doing what I was meant to do. And again, I didn't know what that was. But I knew if I had stayed in my hometown or in New York in this kind of, you know, marketing kind of workaholic mode that I... I wasn't, I, I was it wasn't what I was destined to do. And I didn't know what that was. So I knew I needed a timeout. So um, my grandmother, Morris Shapiro's daughter, my pop, the one that I was so close to, had left her a diamond necklace. And when my grandmother died, she left it to me and she said, don't just keep this in a safe deposit box. Use it. There's going to come a point in your life where that diamond is going to take you places. Don't like hold on to it. So I thought, all right, I'm taking the diamond and I'm selling it. And I did, and it bought me a year in Italy. Now, it was not a year of sipping wine on the piazza. Mm -hmm. This was not a, like, you know, bougie kind of experience. Mm -hmm. This was like, all right, I'm going to go, I'm going to start in Rome. I'm going to go to language school, which was very humiliating at 35. (laughs) Mm-hmm. And I'm going to go to language school. I was staying, I was staying with an Italian senora that boarded, you know, it, it, students. So here I am, I'm 35. I've like rented out my, I've leased out my condo. I've like left everything, and um, I go over there. My bags get lost. Any Italian I knew flew out the window. Um, so I arrived in Rome, no luggage, no language. And um, I get to uh, Signora Rizzo, that was her name, um, apartment in near the Villa Borghese and not in the tourist section of town. And she lived in, <clears throat> her apartment was on the third floor. And... Um, the, the people from the language school picked me up at the airport and they took me to her apartment and they said, a senora does not speak any Itali- um, uh, English. You speak Italian now. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I, I was, I had been traveling for 36 hours. I had left my whole life behind And she ushers me in and she's speaking to me in rapid fire Italian. And I can't understand. No, no capisco. I mean, I understood. Niente, nothing. And um, she's trying to say to me now, um, are you hungry? Can I feed you? Mm. And I just looked at her and burst into tears mm-hmm. like like there was this this moment of just being so vulnerable mm-hmm. like like i wasn't the the marketer who could talk their way out of a paper bag you know i wasn't i 
I was none of the things I thought I was. I was, I was bare. I was starting. I was, it's, it's almost like having a layer of skin removed, you know, you just like, there I am just so vulnerable. And, um, She's so, she was, she took me back. She washed my face to help me wash my face. And she sat me down at her table. And then another um, student who was boarding came in and he was from Thailand. (laughs) Um, Che Ming, his name was, and he spoke Italian and English. So he was the translator and she made just a simple pasta pomodoro and she put it in front of me and I took this bite of this food and I felt so loved and nourished from the, in the it's like that food was the connection for all these people at the table who were I'm a nice Jewish girl from Pikesville, Mar- Baltimore, Maryland. You know, she is this, you know, woman from Calabria that, you know, I don't know. I mean, she's very formidable, right? Mm-hmm. Even though she was really nice. Um, and, and you know, Che Ming from Thailand. And here we are sitting around this table. And, like, the bells went off. Mm-hmm. So... I would go to language school, get totally humiliated um, because I didn't pick up language that way, like grammatically fast. Because you also weren't an auditory learner. Right. I wasn't an auditory learner. So uh, the best way um, to learn was like watching and especially in the kitchen. So I would watch Signora in the kitchen and she was making dinner one night and I asked her if I could make the pasta and she looked at me with the side eye (laughs) and and, um so she had the the kitchen um had these beautiful windows that opened out into this courtyard and there was a restaurant below with the ambient sounds and and uh it it was just a very special place so I I I said no 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 I can do this so I I'm doing my homework, but I go and I take the pasta and I put it in the pasta water and and she's just uncomfortable with the whole scenario. And she just keeps looking at me because I went down to sit back down and conjugate some, some verbs, you know. And she is staring at me and I'm I'm just kind of whatever. And she's like, she takes a string of the pasta out of the pot and she tastes it. And then she takes the pot of water and she walks to the windows and she dumps the whole pot of pasta with the steaming water out the window. And she says in Italian, you stupid American girl, you never walk away from the pasta pot ever. <laughs> like, oh my God. Well, you know, that was just like, that was like the wake up call too. You never walk away from the pot. And in my entire culinary career, it's like, I will be in any kitchen I've worked in, right? It's like, if I see somebody not being present, I mean, this was, these were the lessons I was getting in Italy throughout the whole trip. Be here, be now, be present. Be present. Do not, you know, there's no other place you can be. You cannot hide from anything. You can't hide from your feelings. You can't hide from yourself. You can't hide from overcooking the pasta. You can't talk your way out of anything. This is like real. So um, after Rome, I went to Florence and I ended up meeting a woman who changed my life. And she was this uh, cooking teacher that, uh, and she was a wonderful chef. 
and she took me in. What was her name? Her name is Judy. Her name is Judy Witz Francini. So she's another like major turning point. And I was going to this language school in Florence, and they had cooking as like you know like a a fun thing for students to do on a Friday night. Mm-hmm. And um, I was supposed to meet Judy Witz Francini. Um, on this street corner of Via Tadea at 5.30, and I got the time wrong. I thought it was 5. I'm never early for anything in my whole entire life. <laughs> Greg Kellogg can tell you this. I'm like, so here I am. I'm waiting for her, and I think, oh, my God. Like, where is this woman, right? And I was about to leave, and there she strolls up. She starts talking to me in Italian. Now I know enough. I'm afraid to speak it, but I understand. So she takes me to her studio, where her studio kitchen is, right over the markets, the the, uh, farmer's market, this big marketplace in the center of Florence. And there were all of these students from all over the world, especially Japan, because people would come from Japan to study art and to paint frescoes. And um, part of the way they could do this is just take cooking classes on the side so they'd get credit for it. So here I am again in like this whole other world with people from all over the world and I'm cooking. And um, I started doing this every Friday night and She, for the second week, she asks me where I am from. And I was able to answer her in Italian. And she said, oh, you're from America, in English, with an American accent. She goes, you're from New York? I'm from San Francisco. I said, why have you... You've been talking to me in Italian for two weeks. You couldn't have given me a break. And she goes, no, no, you're, you're here to learn Italian. But she said, um, you're a really good cook. Um, why don't you, you know, after school, after your studies, why don't you come over and just, you know, work with me? You can help me prep out my classes, do some private cooking. You know, I'll keep you busy. And that, so I started cooking. With Judy, I became her culinary slave. And then I found this great kind of bohemian studio where near where I was lodging to paint in the morning with like all these expats. It was like, it was like the only, it was sort of like um, it was like a uh, like just you could rent a little piece of space and paint. So there were like eight of us and we'd have weekly critiques. So I would paint in the morning and then I would cook in the afternoon. By this time, I just dumped language school. I said, forget it, I'm not wasting my time. But I learned I learned Italian as I went by associating it with activities. And what was happening to your pain? Um, my pain was I'd have good days and I'd have bad days, you know, and but I I managed it. But was there any, and this is just curiosity, I'm not fishing for an answer, was there any evidence that moving into the life that you were truly meant to live was in any way diminishing the severity or the frequency of the pain? Um, yes and no, mm-hmm. because there were, there, were, uh, there were physical, there were some real physical things. Drivers. Uh, yeah. Drivers yeah. in there. But what it did is that it put things more in the background, mm-hmm. right? And... Um, I was able to manage it. I get it. Much better, mm-hmm. you know. It, it it wasn't the it wasn't the driving force of my life I anymore, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and what it did for me mentally was, you know, just 
amazing. So let's just take this moment because it feels like a really transformative moment. It was. 29, you have a hysterectomy, right? 32, but 29, I'm, I'm in terrible. 29, you're terrible depression. 32, you have the hysterectomy. Right. And you're working through it. You're driving through it. 35, you just decide, I've got to take a sabbatical for this. You sell a diamond. You get over there. And you go to the language school. You have the experience of being of the senora telling you never walk away from your pot of pasta. <laughs> you go to Florence, you meet this amazing teacher, as you've described, and then she says to you, you're a good cook, come over, and you've also found this expat studio. So you ditch the language school, you're deeply connected uh, with the culinary teacher and your painting. And this in the midst of having gone through this terrible experience of both realizing that you weren't cut out to be a star on Broadway, right? And then working all these different jobs and, you know, incredibly drive and grinding yourself to the bone all these valuable experiences in the long run, but just realizing if you keep doing this, it's just gonna get very dark, right? So you, 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 you sell the diamond, you go, and here we are in Florence at this moment, which seems pivotal to me, where you realize uh, this is a gift in which I feel alive. Here I can paint, here I can cook, the spatula in one hand, the paintbrush in the other, right? Okay, I just wanted to capture that moment. So did you experience that? Did you, in the, at the moment, in that time, did you experience that as a turning point? In yes, your life? Mm-hmm. yes. And it was also a time where I really started digging in spiritually because uh-huh. there were lots of spiritual like 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 signposts along the way. Um, one of the senoras that I met was really into astrology. And there in Italy, you know, they have college courses in it. It's like Oh, I know. Yeah. And you know, all all of these different things and and um I was also very into uh the rune cards. So, and then I just, just, I I can't even describe. It was like there was something that was guiding me deeply inward that said, pay attention. Just, just pay attention. Like, you're awake now, like like the antenna was up. Like I I wasn't writing the script anymore. I wasn't pushing. These things were happening to me. And I think when that happens, that's when magic happens. For me, it was like, God, I like I am letting go of control because I can't really, I mean. What I'm here to do to figure it out, and I'm not sure what that's going to be, but this is this is my shot at it, you know. So as a result, you know, these messengers came. Um, some were cab drivers, some were like Judy Witz Francini, some were like Signor Rizzo, but there were all of these these experiences that that happened during the year that I was there, and but the biggest, biggest takeaway. The food was the big, big driver and the cooking. Because in Italy, um, food is like nourishment. Like people eat to nourish one another. And that there's a celebration around the table. That there's, that, that it's thought about differently than here. And 
um, I would go to the market every day and I would buy fresh vegetables every day. And the process of cooking in and of itself, you have to be present, right? Because there's a beginning, a middle and an end and you're, you know, you're chopping the eggplant and you're salting it and you're, or you're, you're, you know, you're, 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 you're learning how to cut the artichoke and you're watching something simmer and it's alchemy. And that was like, because that was my healing. Like my spirit was starting to heal through that food. Like I felt I was being nourished. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even though I was dealing with pain, I would say my health, my overall health was improving Mm -hmm. dramatically because of this scenario that I was going through. You know, you're well aware of this because I know very well and because you have worked with Andrew Weil and others in integrative and functional medicine, but you're very well aware that the um, there is a deep gut brain connection, and so you were in the reproductive organs challenged. Yeah. But in the gut, the uh, signals, the receptors in the gut, which match brain receptors, uh, were being ignited. Right. And so this gut brain connection was lighting up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how beautiful. So it really, it was a, it was so a. So that was a tr- profound turning point. And I came back and I was like, you know, I think I have really found mm-hmm. my, I, I, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but I felt like, yeah, I'm going to culinary school at 37. You know, by the time I got back and I settled in and I worked with my dad in his business for a while um, because we were getting ready to sell it. And um, I had a beautiful time working with him. Then I applied to Anne-Marie Colbin's um, Natural Gourmet Institute Culinary School for what was called the Natural Gourmet Cookery School when I went there, and then it got a fancy title. Um, And I, all I studied was food and healing. And um, that's what I was going to do. I had no idea how I was going to do it. But my first internship, and this was another message, was for Deepak Chopra Center for Wellbeing when it Uh was in La Jolla. And they only gave out one internship and you had to get yourself out there and you had to find a place to live. So my Northwestern buddy, um, I call, I I said, how am I going to get out there? So I called my friend who knows everybody. She goes, oh my God, you know, um, I know somebody who's got to direct a show in New York Um, He's the artistic director of the La Jolla Playhouse, and he's looking for somebody to house sit for six months. So I packed up the car, my Volvo, and I moved west. And that's how I came to the West Coast from that. Like, what was are the Deepak chances? Chopra around? Oh, yes, he was. So let me ask you a question, because I've met him, uh, many things I respect about him a great deal. But I have been told that Deepak Chopra is able to read directly from the Akashic Record. And I'm curious as to whether you uh, believe that to be true. Yes. Yes. That's a really big deal. Yes. You, yeah. He... He is, um, he was, the summer that I cooked there, mm. the time that I was there, um, he, his executive chef was a woman, which she was amazing. And his whole family was there from India. His, his brothers, his, and his wife, so lovely, unbelievable. His kids came. It was like the whole, it was like family. 
And um, that is when I truly got into meditation. And um, what, what did you make of the fact? Did you know at that time that he could read from the Akashic Record? No. All right. But did you feel that he was in touch with uh, invisible energies? Yes. All right. And how did him being in touch with invisible energies fit with your worldview at that time? Did it fit easily or was it... uh, I mean, you'd already gotten involved with astrology in Italy, but I'm just curious whether the internal world of invisible forces and energies was becoming more visible to you or whether it was an interesting hypothesis but you didn't really get into it? Where were you? Well, at that point, it's very interesting because um, in culinary school, um, I I started doing transcendental meditation. Okay. Um, Then when I I got to the Chopra Center, um, I got my mantra from... Mm -hmm. Deepak and I started doing things his way. And one of the comp- one of the small gatherings he had, he had his first kind of synchro destiny kind of uh, um, group at that point was that point. And um, I I don't know that I really understood understood, but I definitely was receptive. Hmm. I didn't, I was thirsty. Hmm. At that point, I was super thirsty. Um, And uh, because I had just kind of gone through this transformation, Hmm. transformational experience, and I was now like, wow, I'm in it. Like, so I was like, I was very, I was very receptive. Now you said I'm healing? Is that- I'm, I'm in it. Like I'm in my, oh, like okay. I'm traveling in my life in yeah. a way that is starting to feel okay, more Okay, so you're truly organic. awakening. Yes. All right. So you know that feeling when you're starting to wake yeah. up? Yeah. And so all of these things become mm-hmm. possibility. Mm-hmm. So I was very receptive. Mm-hmm. And he was... Um, I didn't have very much interaction directly with him mm-hmm. um, in, a, on a, in a one-on-one. But I will tell you that he treated the kitchen with such... Every single cook in that kitchen, he would always come in every single day and welcome everybody oh, in. Yeah. yeah, the whole thing. I mean, he was... Uh, uh, he was he was he was very accessible and available, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and his wife was one of the loveliest women, and his kids. And I had to cook for his um, daughter because she didn't particularly like Indian cuisine. She liked things more Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. So they they were like, okay, you're just going to cook for her because. You're hot off the boat from Italy, so Mm -hmm. go to it. But the best story from that time, this ranks with the sugar story. Um, He had a saint that came and visited him, and her name was Sri Ma. And she came from Northern California, and she was a very small, she, smaller than, Smaller than us, small. I mean, small and like this. I mean, thin. Like I thought the wind was going to blow her away. And um, Leanne Backer, who was the executive chef, said, "Who made the doll today?" And I raised my hand. She goes, "And did you taste it?" And I said, "Yes." And she goes, "Okay, you are cooking for the saint." And I said. Really? And she said, yeah, because here's the thing. The saint can't really have any, like one person has to cook and now you can't taste anything else. Like everything has to be pure. Mm -hmm. So just no more tasting, right? She goes, you did the tasting like Mm -hmm. correctly with the mother spoon and, Mm -hmm. you know, you didn't 
go in and taste and then put your spoon back in. And I'm like, no, no, no. And she goes, you made the doll, you're cooking for the saint. And by the way, when you cook for her, you cannot taste anything. Now, I'm like, you've got to be kidding because I'm all about like taste as you go and this is how I learned and, you know, this is how you cook. You you can't cook without tasting food. How are you going to do that? She said, Rebecca, I'm serious. This is like a a thing. I just need you to honor it. And she goes, you're going to get distracted by, because now everybody's taking over your, like the soup that you were making and everything else. And you're going to see things in the kitchen that are going to make, piss you off, but you're going to have to let it go because not only can you not taste the food, but you need to meditate while you're making the food. No bad juju in that food. Now, this was a a very important lesson, right, for somebody like me at the time that was like, I'm chef a go-go, you know, I'm like, And I had to take it down. And I had to be very present with everything that I was doing. And this was cooking with intention. And I was cooking with the intention to nourish this woman because I saw her and I was like, it looked like she hadn't eaten in like, I don't know, four weeks. So, but... I got to this point where it was like, I have got to taste this, this, this one thing. I just got to do it. So I put it on a different plate and I, I tasted it. And I was like, I'm so glad I tasted this because it really needs adjusting. So I was like, okay, I tasted one thing. You know, the earth hasn't fallen. I'm going to let it be. So the food goes out. She eats everything on her plate. They're like, her people were like, she ate all her food. She never eats her food. I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, that's because nobody's tasting the food and she probably doesn't like it, right? So there was this sad song afterwards and she was going to give everybody a blessing, right? And my chef, Leanne Backer, takes me she goes, don't get out of your chef clothes. I want you, I want to introduce you to Shri Ma. Now I'm scared because I've tasted the food and I'm thinking she is going to know it and something's going to happen to me. I'm going to get the evil eye on me. I don't know. I was scared, right? So she does all the blessings and she goes and she gives everybody a blessing. It was a really beautiful experience. So I go up with Liam. And Leanne says, this is, you know, um, our intern, Rebecca Katz, and she prepared your food. And I thought, this is it. She's psychic. She knows. (laughs) This is the end of the line for me. And she takes my cheeks in her hand and she squeezes them and looks in my eye. I thought are you a saint or a Jewish booby, (laughs) right? And she thanked me and she gave me this hug. And Leanne, it's like, Leanne said, so what were you so nervous about, right? And then we walk away and I'm just, you know, and she goes, Rebecca, you tasted the food, didn't you? And I said, yes. (laughs) (laughs) You tasted the food. I said, yes, and I thought I was going to get, you know, mm-hmm. whatever. And she goes, no, it's okay. You got the <laughs> blessing. You're you're cool. You're cool. But did you learn something from that exercise? And I said, yeah. And I'll tell you something. that. So I have a recipe in one of my cookbooks that's called um, Doll Cooked for a Saint. Mm-hmm. So, but again, this was a major, major, major lesson about again, cooking to to nourish. And I keep harping on that because um, as I moved on, uh, this was the calling from different experiences and different people and accessing um, a part of my library 
back there of authenticity and where you come from as a cook and as a chef or as an artist. It's with the intention to nourish and heal. That's something it's, I, I think now I would say, Michael, that at where I am now in my early 60s, I feel like there's a part of the library of experience, right, that you're maybe not conscious of. And it could be the library of past lives. It could be a call. It could be something where you find out you land where you're supposed to be. You're not quite sure how you get there, right? Because you don't see the big picture yet. But I felt like I was pulling on some sort of energy or experience. Like how I dove in and made the rest of my career happen, I really don't know. You know, there's this thing going on in the back of my mind, which I'm going to just take a few minutes with. But before we began, I asked you what your astrology was. Could you say it again? Yes. So um, my sun is in Cancer. My moon is in Virgo. And my rising sign is Capricorn. And your north node is Leo. And Leo. So I'm not an astrologer. But knowing you and knowing that, it's so resonant. So let's just walk through it for a minute. Cancer, that's the house of the home. Uh, Cancers tend to be very sensitive, right? They're very home-oriented. So the whole culinary thing fits beautifully in that, right? Yeah. And then the... uh, the rising sign is Capricorn, which Capricorn. is Capricorn. So Capricorn is the driving upward, get it done, I'm gonna make it happen, mm-hmm. and so on and so forth. And then the moon is in Virgo. Virgo. So Virgo is the detail, the teacher, by the way. Yeah. The culinary translator. It's like me. and then the Leo is of course the expansive um, good on the stage, you know whole thing. So all those pieces really resonate in archetypal terms. And then the time in Italy, and what was going on for me is there is a very great figure in um, Renaissance Italy who was named Marsilio Ficino. And um, And James Hillman, who is the great founder of archetypal psychology, who many of us put at the same level as Freud and Jung. Hillman was Jung's uh, greatest student, and he was the bad boy who split from Jung ultimately and founded the field of archetypal psychology. And after he split from Jung, um, he discovered Ficino, and Ficino provided him with a earlier template than Freud and Jung for his own archetypal psychology. And uh, one of his students, uh, uh, um, Hillman's students, uh, Thomas Moore, uh, wrote actually a book called The Archetypal Psychology of Marsilio Ficino. So I think Ficino was in Florence, but I know for a fact that uh, Hillman is revered in Italy. And um, I believe that part of that is because he goes back to Marsilio Ficino. So what I'm saying is that when you speak of astrology being taught in schools over there, and as you very well know over here, while it is poo-pooed and rejected by the secular materialist um, uh, establishment, there is a community of people around the world, but Rick Tarnas comes to mind as a truly great figure here, um, who have gone profoundly into astrology as an archetypal science. And Rick Tarnas worked with Stanislav Grof. You talked about the breathing work, and uh, Grof and uh, and uh, Hillman worked together at Esalen. Uh, actually, 
exploring psychedelics as they connect with um, people's experience on psychedelic journeys with their astrological readings. So all I'm doing here is pointing to the fact that when you mentioned awakening to astrology and how seriously that is taken in Italy, there's this very long, important history of astrology as a, a deep archetypal system. And what I want to say about astrology just for a moment is that, because I've really thought about this, you don't have to believe in the uh, predictive power of astrology to recognize that Jung was right when he said that astrology contained all the psychological knowledge of the ancients and that what they did was to create a system of, uh, of memes that have been tested for thousands of years of different very profound archetypes and that these archetypes light up different dimensions of human experience. So even if our birth signs are just randomly assigned by our dates, even if there's nothing more to it, and it's mysterious whether there is something more to it, nonetheless, they provide us with these incredibly powerful archetypes that light up different dimensions of our experience. So when I say to you that your astrology seems to fit, right? It's because for me and for you, even if these were randomly assigned to you, uh, they light up experience in a set of ways that conventional secular uh, psychology does not light things up for us. So I just wanted to take that moment to acknowledge, because this is a spiritual biography, that this awakening and the part, at least small part, that the astrological experience played and then uh, the, the other uh, messengers who've come to you in the form of your grandfather, your father, um, your, the signora in Rome, uh, the teacher in Florence, um, that to me, these are elements of a spiritual biography. Yeah. So, you have finished your internship with Deepak Chopra, who you do believe reads from the Akashic Records. And for those who don't know, the Akashic Records are a Hindu theory that all of knowledge is contained in Akashic Records, and some people are able... Edgar Cayce being a great example in America, the founder of American Holistic Medicine, Rudolf Steiner's opposite number, and they lived at the same time. So this, this point about access to Akashic Records or access to past lives, and whether, uh, obviously, in uh, secular conventional uh, theories, there's absolutely nothing to that. But I just want to say one further aside, a uh, recent New York Times article on how the standard model of cosmology is falling apart and how we may need to rethink it and recognize other dimensions and my own hypothesis that a lot of the things that we can't explain in conventional terms may come to be understood uh, as we uh, move into uh, potentially a participatory anthropic vision of the universe uh, that includes other dimensions of experience. So that's just a little parenthetic riff to uh, introduce. Any reflections before we go on on that little riff? No, that's just <laughs> we'll perfect. Let it go. perfect. <laughs> I mean, it just sums it up. Yeah. Okay. So you finished your uh, your internship with Deepak Chopra. What happens next? That's uh, important, the next uh, important part. Well, the next step was that um, I got my first real job mm -hmm. in Mendocino. That's where you were. And that's where I was when Waz found me. Ah. And uh, the big spiritual awakening there was, um, it was, again, it tested me. Um because I was kind of thrown into the fire 
in, in that culinary world. And I'm glad I experienced it because, again, uh, it, it prepared me for the next step. That you didn't want to do that for the rest of your life. No way. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, having done it, um, I see. How long were you there? I was there for two years. So, so that's it was a big it, it was a big it was a big deal, and I, I this is something very significant actually did happen. Um, my father, while I was there, was diagnosed with um, cancer of the larynx, mm. and uh, I was able to take two weeks off. Um, and he had just had surgery, and um, I wanted to go back and be with him and help my mom cook for him because he was just started radiation treatment. And at the time, there was there was like no cookbook. There was no like, I how am I supposed to cook for him? the swallowing issues, you know, all of these different issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that um, I was doing at the Chopra Center and then at in Mendocino was I was making these cashmere sweater soups, these blended soups that were, uh, that could go down very easily, but you could get a lot of nutrition and taste and flavor. And I was monkeying around with my magic mineral broth at the time. And, you know, I was doing a little alchemy, but there was no, like, okay, if somebody is diagnosed with cancer, this is how, this this is what you do. There, there was none so of that. So Waz calls you, you start in the cancer health program. You continue for some time to cook in the cancer health program. Yeah. How many years did you cook? Oh, in I cooked until 2010. And then I started doing, um, you know, the, the what I called the culinary confessionals, where um, just uh, where I would come in once, you know, like I think on maybe it was Fridays or Thursdays. And do a session. And do individual sessions mm. with each of the participants mm. and their partners. And... Um, and that was based on finding where their culinary GPS was and how they could make small shifts and changes while they were either going through treatment or past treatment or whatever. Um, when and, I, and recognizing there that something not everybody knows, that cancer treatments often profoundly change people's oh, taste. Big and time. the issue of whether they can eat or not uh, and the fact that food doesn't appeal to them is profound and the um, incredible importance, as you and I know, and uh, our Cancer Choices website makes clear that nutrition not only profoundly matters in preparing for surgery and so on, going through treatment and afterward in terms of uh, building resilience and so on, uh, but that in the radical remission stories that Kelly Turner and others have studied, that actually dietary shift is one of the best predictors of extended outcomes and so on. So we're into a very rich field in which you were one of the pioneers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, I happen to have here... The first uh, book. The first book. Is this the first one? This is the very first one. Yeah. One Bite at a Time. Yep. Which came out when? 2004. So I was cooking here when this, you know, I mean, Common Wheel was my, when I wasn't cooking at the retreats at that time, I was teaching and working with some of Keith Block's patients. Like, Keith Block being one of the great pioneers of integrative of oncology, oncology, a close right. friend and colleague. So I was working deep, like very deeply with people who were going through treatment and, and to your point, having these transient taste issues. So this book really introduced that concept of, well, I called it fast, fat, acid, salty, sweet, but how to make foods during cancer treatment taste correct, depending on what was going on with you. And that's something I honed here. Like, all of my work in with 
the Cancer Finding Kitchen, which came after One Bite at a Time. All of this work happened at Commonweal because this was the, the I was in the, I was in the, uh, in the kitchen it, with all of these people, you know? So, one bite at a time, the cancer fighting kitchen. Was the power of yum the third book after that, or was that that later? was the that was like the last book that I did. Oh, okay. So, but but that concept of the power of yum was yeah. introduced here. Here, yeah. And the other book I have here, I just grabbed to. You know, my wife Charlotte is a, a big cook. I know, know she is. And so the the other book I just pulled off her shelf along with this. Uh, the Healthy Mind Cookbook. And, and you, you always give credit to Matt Adelson as a really critical co-author on some of your work, and he's been very helpful. But the Healthy Mind Cookbook, you know, for all of us who at a certain age begin to think about mental capacity, this is a very profound book. So you've done how many cookbooks all told? Seven. Seven. And so... My experience, and tell me if I've got this right, is that you began to really look into integrative medicine and then functional medicine. And I remember uh, being with you at a, uh, or meeting you as you came out of a functional medicine workshop in San Francisco. Yes. We were going to do something together. Yes. And of course, in the history of the whole movement from holistic medicine to mind-body medicine to integrative medicine to functional medicine. And functional medicine is kind of integrative medicine on steroids in the sense that it takes, you know, Andy Weil is a great believer in integrative medicine. Right. He has lots of interesting questions about functional medicine. He's not so sure about whether all the testing they do and all the supplements they use are as fully demonstrated as the power of integrative medicine. But nonetheless, for those of us who have gone on to look at functional medicine, um, your deep engagement with both integrative medicine, working with Andy Weil, and then with functional medicine, took you into the heart of the, I will say, progressive development of integrative functional thinking about food. Yes. And so you moved on from cancer into the whole world. And so in addition to the Healthy Mind book, we've talked about uh, One Bite at a Time, Cancer Fighting Kitchen, The Power of Young. Then there, was the, then there was the Longevity Kitchen. Longevity and these were like novel, they, these were like things that were all like a little bit ahead, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then I did a whole book of soups, mm -hmm. which is like right. my passion, mm -hmm. clean soups. And then I did a second edition of the Cancer Fighting Kitchen. Mm -hmm. Then I did The Power of Yum. Mm -hmm. And then I worked with Andy Weil on one of his books. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I got my master's of science in nutrition education in 2007. So I was still cooking at the retreat. I was... Where did you do that? I did that online at Hawthorne, through Hawthorne University. Mm -hmm. And I, the only reason why I did it was because I was about to write The Cancer Fighting Kitchen. And... I knew that I had to have... You wanted the science. I, I, yeah, and, and that I, those credentials were going to enable me to cross over as not just being a... I was always going to be a cook from behind the stove. That's how I was going to deliver the information, but I wasn't going to be really taken seriously because most of the work that I did was out in the field, not just with patients, but with doctors and educating them. So I wasn't really going to really... And that's why you call yourself a culinary translator. translator. Yeah. And, and in your books, the, um, the references to the uh, peer-reviewed medical literature are right there. Yeah. So this is very evidence-based slash evidence-informed slash integrative functional. So 
so what you did in this field of um, culinary translation with these seven uh, extraordinary cookbooks, plus your courses, your online uh, blog, your, you know, all of this is extraordinary. It's, it's a great contribution. Yeah. And I was just looking at your website, uh, your, um, your culinary website, um, RebeccaCats.com, mm-hmm. is that right? Now, I noticed that the, uh, the last entries that I see are 2020. So just as we come to this point in the conversation, is 20, did you, con- do you continue to keep some of that work updated or did you decide to kind of wrap it up at some point? I stopped writing my blog in 2020 okay. and then I shifted to doing a newsletter once a month. Mm-hmm. And they don't they they don't get posted, but they mm-hmm. go out to my So they continue to go out. Yeah. And we've used those yes. through cancer choices. Yeah. 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 Um, but I think, you know, and I'm, uh, I made the decision really in 20, well, in 2017, I had just finished like clean soups and, um, and the second edition of Cancer Fighting Kitchen. And I decided it was a good time to put my painting, which was simmering on the back burner, and bring it to the front and move it up on the stove and let it cook a little mm-hmm. bit. And so I um, I started painting. In 2017. Then, in 2017. I had been painting. Like I, I would drive out to Petaluma at, at 90 minutes each way and paint. I, with with somebody there, and this was like all through kind of my cookbooks. I always start kind of with because I'm visual. I have to start that way. So I, I never left my painting, but I mean, I needed to bring it like front and center. Like I I said, I want to make a commitment to this because I want to see. I want to I want to explore it because it's so much like cooking. You know, but I felt like I had said everything I needed to say in my culinary world. I really did. It was a time when now there were just so many voices out there and there were lots of really great special young voices coming out. And I just felt like I've done it. I've done it. Mm-hmm. I've done it now. And that was 2017. Yeah, like like 2017. Mm-hmm. And I still did things, right? Mm-hmm. And and I was still involved in a peripheral. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I really wanted to put the attention on my painting. And so moving to your painting, because um, we've done a, a, a exhibit of your work. Mm-hmm. Um, in 2019? In 2019. And what I want to say is that your paintings are just extraordinary. You know, they're incredibly powerful, many large format, and it's RebeccaCatsArt.com, mm-hmm. is that right? And um, what's extraordinary to me is it's one thing for an athlete to be great in one sport. It's rare for athletes to be really great in two sports. And, and you're a two-sport or, you know, artist, I'll say. Um, your paintings are extraordinary. But more than that, more than them being extraordinary, you've brought the same capacity to communicate about them, uh, to get them out into the world that you brought to this. In other words, there's one thing to be good at the cooking, right? right. It's another thing to be good at communicating it about being a culinary translator, getting the science behind it right, putting out cookbooks, getting the cookbooks out into the world, creating your whole ecosystem of communications. 
But then to repeat that with art is just quite astonishing. It's one thing for your art to be incredibly beautiful and powerful. It's another thing that you're able to get it out there. So, and you talked about your background and how all these pieces came together, the marketing piece and, you know, the communications work and all of that. And I put those experiences, seemingly these random experiences, together with the incredible drive of that high school senior who wanted, she had it all planned out, it was going to work just like this, you know. And then she discovers in college, hey, guess what? It's not going to work for me in the theater, you know, you, but you don't want to cop to that with your parents. You know, you go to New York, you get the waitressing jobs on and so forth. You feel lost, then you have a major surgery, then you have 30 years of chronic pain. And you're, I won't say driving, but with deep intentionality, you're moving through the chronic pain and doing, first of all, this incredible piece of work in uh, healing through nourishment, I will say, yeah. and then in bringing your art to the fore. So what am I missing or what would you add to that little synopsis of my understanding? Oh, I think you, 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 <laughs> I think that was like the best elevator pitch ever. <laughs> Um, I, it's such an interesting time right now to have this conversation because I feel like I, now with my painting, I, um, that I feel like the painting is the true spiritual expression of everything. Like, it's like this, these books and what I gave birth to in the span of 11 years with... with and be- gave birth literally for someone who had a hysterectomy. That's right. This was my... This and these are your babies. These are the babies. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and it's funny because I had a dear friend of mine who um, said to me after I got my hysterectomy, she goes... You will give birth to other things. Mm-hmm. You have to trust that. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, je ne regrette rien, you know, that's about the French I know. But, you know, when I look back and I think what I was able to accomplish, mm-hmm. um, you know, obviously, you know, there were other plans. Mm-hmm. There, somebody had another another. Uh, roadmap for me to mm-hmm. to follow, but the painting is um, comes from a real uh, not not as cerebral. Like here, I had to dance between being creative and inspired, and also that left right brain. When I paint, all the training that I had as a cook and the discipline from being in a kitchen, allowed me to set up a studio practice where I could show up and really produce Mm -hmm. because I had that framework. And I, but the act of painting is truly the act of being in the moment, of being in the process of doing and not of outcome. And because as soon as you get into that outcome or you let that left brain, that editor come in too quickly, mm-hmm. you're, you're losing that. So it is my meditation in motion. The painting really is. So you work in quite a few media in painting. Can you say uh, which media you work in? So I, um, I work mainly uh, my set painting background painting those big drops. Mm -hmm. I like to work large Mm -hmm. when I can. Mm -hmm. So um, in my studio in Sausalito... here's again the compact person with the big, you know... (laughs) So, I mean, it's not just... It's not just I'm a painter, I'm going to paint these little things, but here I'm this small stature person, but man, I'm going to 
paint the world. That's you know, right. I did the theater <laughs> backdrops and my paintings are going to be immense, right? That's right. <laughs> right. I have done, I've done, uh, in fact, I'm much more comfortable painting very large than painting very yeah, small. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, I've painted, uh, done paintings that were uh, seven feet by 10 feet and, mm. you know, paintings that, you know, right now I'm working on one that's four feet by four feet. So that's kind of small, small by your for standards. my standards. And yeah. I have uh, little uh, spinners mm -hmm. that the canvases are attached to that I can spin the canvases around so I can turn canvas upside mm -hmm. down or spin it or mm -hmm. I've got workarounds You've for got being a studio, small. You've got a studio in Sausalito. Yes. In, in the a famous old building. In the industrial center building. And you and your husband, Greg Kellogg, who's here, also happen to live in a, a, a beautiful home that was designed by a famous architect. Yes. Yeah. Um, Henrik Buhl. And you found him wandering in your garden once in yeah. his old age, looking at it, right? Yes. And um, and he came to the door. I said, can I help you? And he said, um, you know, yes, I'm Henrik Bull. I, I was the architect of this house. And I was like, I was like a celebrity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, come on in. Mm -hmm. And Greg was on his way home. And we had a wonderful relationship with when Henrik. did you and Greg meet? Greg and I met, um, yeah, talk about a major... Uh, major turning point. Major turning point in my life. Mm -hmm. um, I met uh, Greg in dis, dis, no, September of 2004, and the Cancer Fighting Kitchen was coming out the next month. Almost 20 years ago. Yes. And we had, um, we met at a friend's birthday party that I didn't want to go to. And it, we had this connection, but um, he was seeing somebody at the time and this book was just coming out. And it turns out that I had my first ever book reading at 39 Rustic Way, which was Greg's house, he had loaned the house to the friend whose birthday party we met at while he was getting his, you know, doing his final diving certification. And so without us having a first date, we had just met each other, I was in his house while he was not there giving a book talk about One Bite at a Time. Then I left him a copy of the book and he calls me up and he leaves me a message and he says, Rebecca, this is Greg Kellogg. I haven't seen you in a while. Perhaps you would allow me to take you to dinner. I was like, that's it. So Greg <laughs> Kellogg, perhaps you would allow me to take you to dinner. Mm. So I I do have to say that- And you said- I said, absolutely, <laughs> I'm calling this guy back. Are you kidding me? <laughs> and, um, and we've been together ever since. Mm -hmm. And uh, he has been the, um, he has made me a better person. He's so my, it's 20 years next year, your 20th yeah, anniversary. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's my everything. Mm. And, oh, the best part is I was working at Commonweal, of course. So all of this cancer, um, the, the cancer uh, uh, health, health program staff was like, you met somebody. You met somebody. <laughs> Who is? What? <laughs> I it was like the big thing <laughs> when I first met Greg. Had to be vetted through everybody. Yeah, right. right. So... So as we begin to bring this together, first of all, what have we not spoken about that stands out for you as a piece or pieces that are part of uh, your evolution? What, what piece or pieces uh, stand out that we haven't explored? I think... If I had to say, like, I'd like, I always like to think of, like, 
a golden thread. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's like if your life is a quilt and there's just this like kind of continuous thread that pulls Mm -hmm. it all Mm -hmm. together. And I kind of feel like um, I... Now that I'm up in the pixie copter and I'm looking at my the life. pixie copter? Yeah. Oh, I forgot. That's a give big me a, Give me a hint. Here. <laughs> I mean, I got an image. <laughs> Small person up. Right, right. Whir- whirling blades, right? right? Is so that the pixie I, copter? I, I, this is my analogy because I, I, I always joke with Greg that I'm, I'm from the planet of pixie and I have, a, I have my own little pixie copter that allows me. I get it. To have right. uh-huh. a bird's eye view. Yeah, yeah. And it's where I go to get perspective. Mm-hmm. And 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 I feel like what's very interesting is that um, if I have to look at the thread and say, "Wow," now looking back on the whole thing, mm-hmm. that everything happened for a reason Mm -hmm. and that we don't always know what the reasons are, right? And we don't, we, like, we couldn't, I couldn't write the story of my life, right? I could maybe write somebody else's. I don't know, or I can imagine, Mm -hmm. but I look at all of the different synchronicities and the people that wove themselves in and out and and the situations and the and 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 it's it's sort of like you know you to not know is to know really and now I think the one thing about where I am now with my paint the painting practice brings it home all the time you just there is this place of trust, you know, where you can just trust somewhere that you will find your way through the process and you will end up in a place that maybe you would never imagine in a million years. I was going to be a Broadway, star on Broadway, right? But, I, you know, now I look back and I think, wow. I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm astonished, and I feel like, wow, that's a really cool place to be. I just also want to mention not only our deep friendship, but your friendship with Orrin Slosberg and other people at Commonweal. Uh, Arlene Alsman came in to greet you with a huge hug. Kira Epstein, many of our staff uh, really care about you. But your ongoing profound commitment to our work and support, and I just want to acknowledge, you know, um, I just want to acknowledge how how important that is at every level, you know, and um, and just being fellow journeyers, um, And, you know, what really strikes me is because, I mean, one of the beautiful things I love about doing these spiritual biographies is I just have a passion for understanding people through their stories, you know. And I I have a passion for bringing all the pieces together so that we can see the patterns, you know. And I just look back at that whole story, um, the lineage from your great grandfather who comes over from the Ukraine to escape the pogroms and uh, lands with 25 cents in his pocket and ends up buying the boat that he, you know, came over on. Was that right? Mm-hmm. And and him dressing you in a little captain's outfit and naming one of his tugs after you and just the whole story. I think this is true of everybody's story, but if you really explore someone's story with them with deep love and a sense of communication, there's an integrity to our stories, you know? And, and 
And when you said you had, the, you know, six surgeries and the pain stayed with you from age 29 to 59, but you realized that you weren't going to let it define your life, you know? And for a lot of people, 30 years of pain would define their life. Yeah. But you knew that it was not going to, you know? And just going from that dark, dark place in New York where you didn't know what you were going to do, but you knew it was going to be something, and then taking your grandmother's diamond and selling it and having enough to just get yourself to Italy and and then discovering that cooking and painting, born with a paintbrush in one hand and a spatula in the other, right? A family of cooks and artists, right? And just the, the sensitive little girl who was the youngest in the family and all the complexities of family life and the suffering that goes with that and your refuge was theater and all the places you could excel, right? Um, it's such a beautiful story. Anything you would add? I don't think so. I, 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 I will say all through this, the one thing that I really uh, became good at was trusting my instincts. And I do think that's a powerful tool that we all have, you know, that maybe when we're younger, we have that, but then because how life is and whatever, maybe that's not, maybe it's too hard. So we maybe ignore it for years and years or whatever. But I think um, that ability to trust there's something very powerful about tuning in to that intuitive self spirit within the guide within that's, I think, become more and more like where I am in my life right now. Um, you know, I'm sure you've thought about this, but your story reminds me of our friend and beautiful colleague, Rachel Naomi Remen's story. Because as you know, she had Crohn's disease and had a major surgery and a, a, a colostomy at 19, I believe, and has lived with a colostomy. Now she's in her 80s, right? Uh, and she had, I don't know, 15 major surgeries. Uh, but like you, she didn't let it define her, right? And she took that energy and became, you know, one of the first women at, uh, in medical school, uh, you know, and then took her medical training and turned it in, to go, went to Aslan and turned it into this extraordinary career um, in founding uh, the Cancer Health Program with us and then founding the Institute for the Study of Health and Illness with us. And, and building this extraordinary career like you with a whole set of, of books, uh, like you with an extraordinary capacity to communicate, um, and now is writing children's books, you know, in her 80s, right? And so um, to me, this is just such a profound part of the blessing of the Commonweal community that it's this place where many of us find ourselves, you know? And the beauty of the community is precisely because it is somewhat mysterious what common will really is. Nobody's ever figured that out. It's a kind of a matrix for the evolution of a community of friends, you know? So, Rebecca Katz, I just feel so deeply blessed, not only that you found yourself... Uh, uh, through Commonweal in many ways, mm. um, but that you care about Commonweal and continue to care about the community, you know, and it's that ability of people who find themselves here and believe that they want to contribute to others. So, 
Thank you for the special opportunity for doing this. You at 62, I at 80. You know, uh, here we still are, you know, 23 years later. So thank you for being with us at the new school. Thank you. An honor. Don't take it, don't, don't, don't. 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 Don't take it, don't.